Welcome to Norton Chemistry. Today we're going to be doing a revision video on the entirety of module 2 in under one hour. Here we've got a table which shows our subatomic particles, our protons, neutrons and electrons. So as we know from GCSE, the relative mass of a proton is 1 and the same goes for a neutron and electrons have virtually negligible mass and the relative charge of a proton is plus 1. Neutrons are neutral so they have zero charge and electrons have a minus one charge. We've got this image here which shows how the elements are laid out in the periodic table. So X represents an element. If you just have a look at the periodic table, you can see that above the element there is the atomic number and then below the element there is the mass number. Your atomic number represents your number of electrons or your number of protons, they're the same. And the mass number is your relative atomic mass. If we look down here where it says relative masses, relative atomic mass is the weighted mean mass of an atom of an element relative to one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon 12. Why this is important is because we have isotopes of elements. So isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons and a different number of neutrons. So for example, you can see over here that deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen and it has a different mass number from hydrogen 1 because it has an extra it has a neutron whereas hydrogen 1 doesn't have a neutron it only has one proton and one electron so they both have the same atomic number but a different mass number and obviously that that's why deuterium is referred to as heavy nitrogen isotopes of the same element have the same electronic configuration so that's the arrangement of electrons in their atoms they react similarly so they have similar chemical properties but may have slightly different physical properties. For example, deuterium is heavier than hydrogen 1. And then we've got some definitions which are really important. They often come up in exams. So you've got relative isotopic mass, which is the mass of an atom of an isotope compared with 1 12th of the mass of an atom of carbon 12. And then we went through relative atomic mass earlier. That is probably the most important of the bunch or relative molecular mass as well which is the weight, weighted mean mass of a molecule of an element, for example oxygen, which is a diatomic element, or compound to one twelfth the mass of an atom of carbon-12. So that's similar to the relative atomic mass, but it's for a molecule of an element or a compound. Ionic compounds contain oppositely charged ions, and they have an overall charge of zero. When we're writing the formula of ionic compounds, we need to consider the charge of the ions in the compound. So for example, in sodium carbonate, we have Na plus and CO3 two minus ions. So in order to balance out the overall charge to zero, we need to have two ions of sodium to every one ion of car of carbonate. Then we'll go on to talk about balanced equations. So we need to remember when we're writing balanced equations to write state symbols. If the example would ask for it, then you definitely need state symbols. But if they don't ask for it, then I usually put them, but you may not need to put them. And then ionic equations. So this is when only reacting ions and the products they form are included. So we remove what we call spectator ions. So we've got a question. We need to determine the ionic equation for this reaction. So we've got sodium chloride reacting with silver nitrate, forming silver chloride and sodium nitrate. So if we go ahead and just write out the ions present. So we've got Na+. Plus, and Cl minus and Ag plus and NO3 minus. Now notice that we have two aqueous reactants forming one solid product and one which is a precipitate and one aqueous product. These ions are no longer present in solution so we just form AgCl which is solid. We've also got Na plus ions and NO3 minus ions. So then we need to identify and remove our spectator ions. We can see that Na plus is present on both sides of the equation, so we can go ahead and remove that. Then we've got Cl minus, but that's not present on the other side because that's forming AgCl, which is solid. So there's a, so we don't remove that. Ag plus, once again, we don't have that on the other side, so we can't remove that. But we do have NO3 minus on both sides, so we can go ahead and remove those spectator ions. So then we just simply write our ionic equation with our, all our state symbols. So we've got aqueous ions reacting to form our precipitate, which is a white precipitate, and this comes up in later in this specification in qualitative testing. We're going to talk about moles and concentrations. So 
This is really, really important. It comes up across the specification. So the mole is the unit of amount of substance, including any atoms, electrons, molecules, or ions. And a mole is the amount of substance that contains the same number of atoms as 12 grams of carbon-12, and the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12 is Avogadro's constant, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 moles to the minus one. We have our equations here, which are really important. We need to memorize these equations. The first one is that moles equals mass over MR. So if you want to determine the amount of moles of a substance, and we know the mass, and we know the molar mass, then we can calculate the number of moles. Alternatively, you can rearrange it to find any one of the three parts of the equation, and then we have concentration, moles and volume, which is also a really important equation. And we can use that to, when we're doing, for example, titration calculations, we need to find the number of moles in, in a known volume and concentration of solution. Or if we need to find the concentration of a solution, which we know the moles and the volume present. Remember that you need to be able to convert between decimeters cubed and centimeters cubed. So one decimeter cubed is 1,000 centimeters cubed. And then also one meter cubed is 1,000 decimeters cubed. That's especially important for the ideal gas equation, which we'll talk about in a bit. So how do you answer these sorts of calculation questions? So we've got a multiple choice question here. If 8.7 grams of potassium sulfate, which is K2SO4, remember from earlier, K plus and SO4 to minus, that means we need two of these K plus ions, is dissolved in water and made up to 200 centimeters cubed. What is the concentration of the solution in mole per dm cubed? So we have to use both of the equations to answer this question. First, we need to find our moles of potassium sulfate, which we're adding to the water. Do that using the first equation, which is moles equals mass over MR, which is 8.7 grams divided by this 174.3 grams per mole and that gives us 0.0499 moles so that our volume is 200 centimeters cubed so to find our concentration we do our moles over our volume and our moles we know is 0.0499 divided by 200 centimeters cubed to convert to dm cubed you divide by a thousand so that's 0.2 dm cubed and then that gives us a value of 0.249 and then we can round that because they have given it to two decimal places so 0.25 that's answer C so our gas equation one mole of gas under standard conditions which is 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees and one atmosphere will occupy 24 decimeters cubed so that's the molar gas volume so if you look have a look at this equation here you can see that we can find the moles of any gas at room temperature and pressure, so standard conditions, by dividing the volume of the gas by 24. And if you wanted to, say, find the volume of gas for a number of moles, you could just rearrange to multiply the number of moles by 24. And then you also need to remember to convert to 24,000 for centimeters cubed for the molar gas volume. But what if conditions aren't standard and it's not room temperature and pressure? Then we need to use the ideal gas equation which is PV equals NRT. So this is a really important equation and it comes up often as five mark questions and you must use specific units in order to get the correct answer. So for pressure, you must use pascals. For volume, you must use meters cubed and then there's the gas constant and then there's temperature, which is in Kelvin. And I'll show you how to convert from uh, standard units to these units. So from centimeters cubed to meters cubed, you have to divide by a million. From decimeters cubed to meters cubed, you have to divide by a thousand. From kilopascals to pascals, you have to multiply by a thousand. And from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you have to add 273. So for example, if we have a temperature of 25 degrees and we add 273 to it, we get 298 Kelvin. So we've got some questions. So at 25 Celsius and 100 kilopascals, a gas occupies a volume of 20 decimeters cubed. Calculate the new temperature of the gas if the volume is decreased to 10 decimeters cubed at constant pressure. So let's write out our equation, PV equals NRT. So first thing we want to do is find the moles of the gas at the original temperature and pressure. So that is N equals PV over RT. Then we need to convert to the correct uh, units. So kilopascals, we times by a thousand to get to pascals. So that's 
100,000 pascals, 25 degrees C, so that's we know that's two, 298 Kelvin because we've added 273. And then our volume of 20 decimeters cubed, we need to divide by 1,000 to get to meters cubed, which is 0 0.02 meters cubed. We can put those into the equation knowing that the R is 8.314, that's on the data sheet. So we have 100,000 pascals multiplied by 0 0.02 meters cubed divided by 8.314 times 298 Kelvin, which gives us 0 0.807 moles. And then we can use that value in the next part of our calculation at the new temperature, 0 .0, 0 0.807 moles. And then, so this time we need to find temperature. So we need to rearrange for temperature, which is going to be uh, 100,000 pascals times 0 0.01 meters cubed this time divided by our moles which we know is 0 0.807 uh, multiplied by our gas constant which gives us 149 Kelvin which is our final answer and then the pressure is decreased to 50 kilopascals as a constant volume so the volumes now 0.02 meters cubed again and our new pressure in pascals because that's the units we need to use 50,000 so then we need to find the temperature again so we just use the same rearrangement and we do 50,000 pascals times 0.02 divided by 0.807 moles times our gas constant 149 kelvin so empirical and molecular formula so the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of elements present in a compound. The empirical formula can be calculated from the percentage compositions by mass. So I've done an example calculation. So I often use this table, which I, which helps you to set it out easily. So you have the mass, moles, the simplest, and the empirical. So you start with the masses of each or the percentage compositions and you then divide each by the MR to get the moles, as we said earlier. Then you divide by the smallest number of moles for each to get the simplest whole number ratio, which in this case is 1 to 2. So it's, that gives you your empirical formula of MgBr2. And then molecular formulae can be determined using the empirical formula and the relative molecular mass, also known as the MR. So for example, if we have an empirical formula of CH2O and an MR of 60, then we can determine the uh, molecular formula. So if we have a look at the empirical formula, the MR of that empirical formula is 30, but our MR is 60. So we clearly uh, need to increase our empirical formula by a factor of two to get our molecular formula. So that gives us C2H4O2. And if we check that, we can see that two times 12 plus four plus 16 times two is 60. So that the MR of our molecular formula is correct. So that means that our molecular formula must be correct. What is a crystallization? It's when water binds into the crystal structure of some ionic compounds, making them hydrated. Anhydrous compounds contain no waters of crystallization. So we need to be able to determine the formula of ionic compounds containing waters of crystallization. In a lab, we can heat hydrated compounds to, to remove the waters of crystallization in order to calculate the mass of water in the hydrated salt. So for example, Epsom salts are crystals of hydrated magnesium sulfate which we represent as MgSO4 with a dot to show the waters of crystallization and the X just represents the ratio of water to the anhydrous salt. The sample is heated to remove the water. 1.57 grams of water was removed, leaving behind 1.51 grams of anhydrous magnesium sulfate. So we can use this data to help us calculate the formula of the hydrated salt. So in this question that I've uh, set out, in part I, we need to calculate the moles of anhydrous magnesium sulfate. So we just use our moles equals mass over MR formula. And that gives us 0 0.0126 moles. And to calculate the amount of moles of water removed, we need to divide the mass of water removed by the MR of water, which we know is 18 grams per mole. And that gives us 0 0.0872 moles. And then to find the value of X, which is usually what they ask you in exams, we're using essentially the same method as when we're trying to find the empirical formula. So we've, we've set out our table, mass, moles, simplest and empirical. So you can see more about this method in the amount of substance video on my channel. 
Um, but essentially, we need to find the moles of each of our components and then find the simplest whole number ratio by dividing by the smallest number of moles, which in this case is the moles of magnesium sulfate. So that gives us a value of 6.92 for the uh, simplest ratio of MgSO4 to H2O. And then we just round that up to 7. So the value of x is 7. However, there are some problems with this method of finding the waters of crystallization because we may not heat the salt enough to remove all the water. So we can avoid this, however, by heating to a constant mass, which means that when you heat the salt, over time you continuously check the mass, and if the mass stops changing, then you know that you've removed all the waters of crystallization. However, we may heat too much and the salt may start to decompose. This is why we need to continuously measure the mass at regular intervals. So as soon as the mass no longer changes between heating, we must stop the heating. So you'd have to heat a salt a lot, but it can happen. So we've got an exam question to go through. So you might want to go ahead and have a go and then I'll go through the answer. So 13.2 grams of a sample of zinc sulfate, ZnSO4.xH2O, was strongly heated until no further change was recorded. On heating, all the water of crystallization evaporated as follows. So we've got an equation that they've given us. So ZnSO4.xH2O goes to ZnSO4 plus XH2O. Calculate the number of moles of water of crystallization in the, in the zinc sulfate sample, given that 7.4 grams of solid remained after strong heat. So the first thing we can do is find our mass of water that we removed. and that So we know we've got 7.4 grams of solid remaining. So that means that we've evaporated 5.8 grams of water. And then we can use the same method as above to find our moles and our ratio to find the value of x. So mass, moles, simplest, and empirical. And then we just set it out at the top, our compounds. So Z and SO4 and H2O. So our mass of water is 5.8 grams. Our mass of Z and SO4 is 7.4 grams. And then we need to divide 7.4 grams by the MR of Z and SO4. So 161.5, which gives us 0.0458 moles. And we'll save that into our calculator using the recall function. And then we'll divide the mass of water by 18 grams per mole, which gives us, and then we'll divide the mass of water by 18 grams per mole, 0.32 moles. We'll save that into our calculator as well. And then we need to divide by the smallest number of moles, which is 0.0548458. So that gives us one for ZnSO4 and for H2O, 7.03. So then our empirical formula is going to be ZnSO4 and we're going to have 7H2O. Examples of acid include HCl or hydrochloric acid, H2SO4 sulfuric acid, nitric acid and phosphoric acid. Acids dissociate in water by the equation HA aqueous forms A- which is the conjugate base and H plus, and acids are proton donors. That's the Bronsted Lowry definition of an acid. The strength of an acid depends on how much it dissociates when it dissolves. So for example, a strong acid completely dissociates in water or aqueous solution. So HCl is an example of a strong acid. So you can see in the equation, we have a arrow pointing in the forwards direction only. So it's fully dissociating to form H plus and Cl minus ions. So we've got a question, which is to write the equations for the dissociation of H2SO4 in aqueous solution. So this is comprised of two equations because it has two H plus ions to donate. So the first equation is, and then the second equation is, we can simplify it to an overall equation of. Then a weak acid is one which only partially dissociates in water or aqueous solution. So for example, ethanoic acid, CH3COOH, is a weak acid. And you can see that in the equation for its dissociation, we have the reversible reaction symbol because there's an equilibrium forming where equilibrium is actually shifted to the left. So we're only for, for each amount of ethanoic acid, we're only forming a small number of H plus ions. Then bases, so we have some examples of bases, potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and ammonia, which is a weak base. The first two are strong bases. And alkalis are bases which dissociate in water. So we have the example equation of XOH, 
so the alkali, dissociating to form X plus and OH minus ions. So for example, NaOH dissociates to form Na plus and OH minus, and bases are defined as proton acceptors. So you can see in this equation that when we put N ammonia in water, it reacts with water forming NH4 plus ions and OH minus ions. So it's gone from NH3 to NH4 plus. That's a gain of one proton. So that's why bases are defined as proton acceptors. It's also an equilibrium because it's a weak base. So if we add more alkali, then the equilibrium will shift to the right and will form more hydroxide. Then the equilibrium will shift in the opposite direction to the left, forming more ammonia. And then we have neutralization reactions. So acids and bases react in neutralization reactions. So when an acid and a base react, they form a salt and water. And remember the definition of a salt is the product of a reaction in which H plus ions are replaced by ammonium or metal ions. And then we have acid carbonate reactions. So an acid and a carbonate react to form a salt, carbon dioxide gas and water. So in each example, H plus reacts with OH minus to form water. Given the overall ionic equation, H plus plus OH minus forms H2O. So if you have a look at this question, which equation does not represent a neutralization reaction? So in a neutralization reaction, an acid has to react with a base or we have to form water. As you can see from A, a metal is reacting with an acid, so that's not an acid-base reaction. And we're not forming water, so that's not a neutralization reaction. So the correct answer is A. And if we have a look at B, C and D, we can see that we're forming H2O in C and D. And in B, ammonia is reacting with sulfuric acid to form a salt, so that's a neutralization reaction. So titrations, acid-base titrations are used to find the concentration of an acid or base sample. A known concentration of an X is gradually added to a known volume of X of unknown concentration until the solution is neutralized, the end point. A burette is used to gradually add the solution of known concentration, and a glass pipette is used to add a, volume, add a known volume of the solution of unknown concentration. We also use an indicator to cause a colour change at the end point, so that's the point of neutralisation in an acid-base titration. Calculations are used to determine the concentration. So we use the, form, we use the formula N equals CV, which is moles equals concentration times the volume, and moles equals mass over MR, help us do titration calculations. So we've got uh, an example question. Which reagent would exactly neutralize 100 centimeters cubed of one mole per diem cubed H2SO4? So we can first find the number of moles of H2SO4, which is going to be 100 over 1000 to convert to decimeters cubed, multiplied by one mole per diem cubed, which gives us 0.1 moles. And then if we have a look at the formula of H2SO4, it's diprotic because it's got two H plus ions in its formula. So we need, we, for all of our um, reactants, potential reactants, we've got the exact same number of moles, 0 0.1 moles. So we need a dibasic reagent. And if we look at BaOH2, that's the only one with two hydroxide ions for every uh, molecule of it. So that is the correct reagent. Preparing a standard solution, which is a solution of known concentration. So we need to do this in order to accurately get solutions of a precise concentration to use in our titrations, because otherwise our titrations won't be accurate. So magnesium nitrate is used in fertilizers as a source of nitrogen. A student plans to prepare 250 centimeters cubed of a 0.4 mole per diem cubed solution of magnesium nitrate starting from magnesium nitrate crystals, which are MgNO32 with six H2O molecules. Describe how the student would prepare the solution, giving full details of quantities, apparatus, and methods. Use the formula N equals CV, so that's moles is equal to 250 over 1,000 to convert to decimeters cubed, multiplied by the concentration, which is 0.4 mole per diem cubed, which gives us 0.1 mole of magnesium nitrate crystals and then we have a molar mass of 256.3 grams per mole for our hydrated magnesium nitrate and if we do the, calculate the mass that's equal to the moles times the MR which is 0.1 
moles times 256.3 grams per mole, which gives us 25.63 grams. And that's the mass that we'll use in our, to get our standard solution. And then to prepare our standard solution, we first need to accurately weigh the mass of the crystals using the weigh by mass method. Then you need to dissolve the crystals in distilled water and transfer the crystals to a 250 centimeters cubed volumetric flask. So volumetric flasks has, have been specifically calibrated to hold a precise volume of solution at room temperature and pressure. You then need to rinse you then need to rinse any excess remaining solid from your beaker and your weighing boat into the flask using distilled water. And then carefully make it up to the mark with more water so that the bottom of the meniscus aligns with the graduation line. And to help you do this carefully, you can use the drop and prepare at the end. You can then stop her and invert the flask to help it mix thoroughly. So oxidation numbers. An oxidation number is a number representing the number of electrons lost or gained by an atom. The definition of oxidation is the loss of electrons, and it leads to an increased oxidation number. So for example, when you have oxidation of aluminium to form aluminium 3 plus ions, the oxidation number of aluminium increases from 0 to plus 3 as it's lost 3 electrons. And then reduction is defined as the gain of electrons, and it leads to a reduced oxidation number. So for example, when you reduce fluorine by adding an electron to it to form fluoride ions, the oxidation number goes from 0 to minus 1. So there's some rules for identifying the oxidation numbers of elements and compounds and ions. So an element that is not in a compound has an oxidation number of 0. So for example, when you have hydrogen in its diatomic form as an element, the oxidation number is 0. And the second rule is that a simple ion of a single element has an oxidation number the same as the ionic charge. So for example, if you have a H plus ion, which has a charge of 1, one plus, then the oxidation number is going to be plus 1. The sum of the oxidation number of the elements in a compound is equal to the overall charge of the compound. So for example, if you have H2O, which of course is a neutral compound, then the oxidation number of hydrogen is going to be plus 1, and the oxidation number of oxygen is going to be minus 2, which, if you add them together, gives you a sum of 0. And then another rule is that the charge on a complex ion is equal to the sum of the oxidation numbers. So if you have a NH4 plus complex ion, then the nitrogen is going to have a minus 3 oxidation number, and the hydrogen a plus 1 oxidation number, giving a total of plus 1, which is equal to the 1 plus charge of the complex ion. The most electronegative element in the compound always has a negative oxidation number. So, for example, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen. So in F2O, F takes the minus 1 oxidation state and oxygen has a plus 2 oxidation state. Oxygen is always minus 2, except in peroxides where it is minus 1, or fluorides where it takes the positive oxidation number. So, for example... In hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen has a plus 1 oxidation state and oxygen has a minus 1 oxidation state. In most compounds, it is minus 2, however. Hydrogen is plus 1, except in metal hydrides, where it is minus 1. So, for example, in magnesium hydride, the magnesium takes a plus 2 charge and the hydrogen takes a minus 1 charge, because hydrogen is more electronegative than magnesium. Oxidation numbers are represented by Roman numerals when naming compounds. So, for example, in sodium chlorate 1, we represent the oxidation number of chlorine with the 1 Roman numeral, and we represent the element in the compound which has the variable oxidation state. So, for example, you can have sodium chlorate 5, which you represent as sodium chlorate with a V for 5, which is the compound NaClO3. So, we've got a question. Write the equation for the reaction of sodium hydroxide with chlorine and identify all oxidation numbers, including which element is oxidised and which is reduced. So when you react sodium hydroxide with chlorine, you form sodium chlorate 1 in the, when it's um, in the correct conditions, which is cold dilute sodium hydroxide. 
You form sodium chloride 1, which we said is NaClO, and you form sodium chloride and water. And then when we're doing the oxidation numbers, it's easy to set out like this, showing the elements on the side, and then you can go through and identify each oxidation number. So for example, sodium in NaOH is plus 1, oxygen is minus 2, and hydrogen is plus 1. And we know that's correct because when we add them up, we get a total of 0, and it's a neutral compound. Then Cl2 is going to be zero because Cl is a single element on its own. And then NaClO, well, we know that the oxidation number of oxygen is always minus two unless it's in a fluoride or a peroxide. And then sodium is going to be plus one and chlorine is going to make up the difference. So minus two plus one leaves us with minus one. So we need to add an extra one to make it to zero because it's a neutral compound. And then in NaCl, Cl is more electronegative than sodium. So, so Cl takes a minus one oxidation number and sodium takes a plus one oxidation number. And then in water, oxygen is minus two and hydrogen is plus one. So we can see that chlorine has gone from zero in Cl2 to plus one in NaClO, sodium chloride one. So that is oxidation because the oxidation number has increased. And also Cl has gone from zero in Cl2 to minus one in sodium chloride, which is a reduction as the oxidation number has been reduced. Redox reactions involve both oxidation and reduction. Oxidizing agents cause oxidation of other species and so are reduced themselves. And then reducing agents cause the reduction of other species and so themselves are oxidized. So we've got a question. Identify the reducing agent and the oxidizing agent in the following reaction. So we've got HCl reacting with sodium, forming sodium chloride and H2. So let's write our oxidation numbers. So plus one for hydrogen, minus one for chlorine, and then zero for Na because it's in a single element on its own. And then Na is going to go to plus one and Cl is going to remain at minus one. And then hydrogen is going to go to zero as it's on its own. So we can see that hydrogen has been reduced because it's gone from plus one to zero and sodium has been oxidized as it's gone from zero to plus one. So that means that sodium is the reducing agent as it's oxidized, and hydrogen is the oxidizing agent as it's reduced. Electron configurations. Electrons occupy shells. Each shell can hold two n squared electrons, where n is a principal quantum number. So for example, the first shell is n equals one, the second shell is n equals two, and so on. In the third electron shell, there are 18 electrons because we need to use the formula 2n squared where n is 3 and we square 3 multiply by 2 that gives you 18 electrons. Electron shells are made up of orbitals which are areas of an atom that can hold up to two electrons of opposite spin. Remember that definition. Electrons in pairs are both negatively charged so repel each other causing them to rotate or spin in opposite directions. So orbitals make up subshells, which make up shells. S orbitals are spherical and P orbitals are dumbbell shaped. So you can see a drawing. And there are four orbital types, S, P, D and F. There are 1S, 3P, 5D and 7F orbitals possible per subshell. So in the S subshell, there are two electrons. And in the P subshell, there are six electrons. In the D subshell, there are 10 electrons. And in the F subshell, there are obviously 14 electrons. Within each shell, orbitals of the same energy level are in the same subshells. Subshells have different energy levels. Note that 4s is lower than energy in 3D. So if you have a look at 4s here, it's below 3D over here. So 4s will fill an empty before the 3D orbital. Atomic orbitals with the same energy fill individually first before pairing, and the lowest energy level always fills first. So for example, the 4s is lower energy than the 3D, so it fill so the 4s fills first. And then we represent represent electron configurations using this standard method. So n represents the principal quantum number, x represents the orbital type, so for example s, p, d or f, and y is the number of electrons. So we have the electron configuration of potassium. If we have a look at this periodic table over here, I've colour coded the blocks of the periodic table. So to the left we have the s block, then we have the D block in the middle, which is our transition elements. And then the P block to the right. And at the bottom is the F block. So when we're doing our electron configurations, 
we need to locate the atom on the periodic table and identify which block it's in and then we can identify where the highest energy electrons are going to be located. So for example for potassium we can see in the periodic table it's in the red S block. So in the electron configuration we can see that the electrons furthest to the right are in the S subshell and then we can also see that it's one, two, three, four periods down the periodic table. So it's the 4s subshell where the outer electrons are located. And then you can also do the electron configuration of ions. So for the K plus ion, you're obviously losing an electron from potassium. So the electron configuration is going to be the same electron configuration as argon, which we can see over here in the P block. So the new highest energy electrons are going to be located in the P block. Then there's the anomalies, which are chromium and copper. So they have a so they have anomalous electron configurations. So if we have a look at the electron configuration of chromium, we can see that we have one electron in the 4s subshell, and then we have the 3d subshell filling with an extra electron. So normally you would expect it to be 4s2, 3d4, but it's actually 4s1, 3d5. It's just one of those things that you have to learn. And then the same goes for copper. So it's got only one electron, a partially filled 4s subshell, and then an extra electron. So normally it would be 4s2, 3d9, but instead it's 4s1, 3d10. Again, one of those things you just have to learn and they will test you on it. Don't expect them to not test you on it in exam questions. Ionic bonding. An ionic bond is when there is an electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. And in a giant ionic lattice, each ion is surrounded by oppositely charged ions. So we use dot and cross diagrams to represent ionic bonding. So for example, in sodium chloride, we have sodium ions, which have a positive charge, and chloride ions, which have a negative charge because they've taken on an extra electron from the sodium. And the strength of ionic bonds depends on the ionic charge. So the greater the ionic charge, the greater the electrostatic forces of attraction, so stronger ionic bonds. And then ionic size. So for example, smaller ions are closer together in the lattice, so they have stronger ionic bonds. And then the properties of ionic structures, so these are a result of ionic bonds. High melting slash boiling points, they're soluble in polar solvents, and they conduct electricity when aqueous slash molten, but not when solid. I've got a question to asking us to explain the properties of ionic structures. The high melting slash boiling point is due to the strong ionic bonds, which require a lot of energy to overcome. And they're soluble in polar solvents because the ions can be surrounded by the polar solvent, for example, water molecules. And the, because the ions are charged, they can interact with the polar molecules and the ions can become pulled apart by the polar solvent, so they enter an aqueous solution. So in water, the positive ions are attracted to the delta negative oxygen atoms and the negative ions are attracted to the delta positive hydrogen atoms. Then they conduct electricity when aqueous slash molten, but not when solid. Because when ionic lattices are solid, they're held in the lattice structure by the strong ionic bonds. So the ions aren't mobile, they're not free to move, they can't conduct electricity. Whereas when they're aqueous or molten, the ions become mobile as the ionic bonds are overcome, so they can conduct electricity. Then covalent bonding. So the definition of a covalent bond is a strong electrostatic attraction between a shared pair of electrons and the nuclei of the bonding atoms. So for example, we've got water which has covalent bonds between the oxygen and hydrogen atoms. So it has two single covalent bonds and then it has two lone pairs of electrons and then oxygen has a double bond and each oxygen atom has two lone pairs. And then we have something called the dative bond which is when one of the bonding atoms donates both shared electrons in a covalent bond. So for example, in the NH4 plus ion, one of the bonds is a dative covalent bond because the nitrogen atom is the only atom which donates the electrons in the bond. And then average bond enthalpy is defined as a measure of the enthalpy required to break one mole of a covalent bond. So then we have simple molecular structures. So for example, chlorine, water, ammonia, and they have low boiling points. So in the solid state, they're held together by only weak intermolecular forces, which require little energy to overcome. So electron pairs repel each other. So electron pairs repel each other, so arranged as far apart as possible in space. Lone pairs of electrons repel more strongly than bonded pairs. So we can see in water, we've got lone pairs, which are on the oxygen atom, 
and they're not in any bonds. And then we have the bonded pairs between oxygen and hydrogen atoms. And we have a molecule of CH4 methane. When we draw a single line, that just means we're in the plane of the paper. Then when we have a dashed line, that means we're going it back into the paper. And then we have, when we have a triangle, that means we have an atom coming out of the plane of the paper. Don't worry about this too much. You just need to remember how to draw the molecules for specific shapes. And molecular shape is determined by electron pair repulsion theory. So we've got a table and we're going to fill this in. So if you've already learned this in class, try and have a go and fill it in. But I will go through it as well. So we have lots of different shapes of molecules. And you need to memorize these shapes and the number of electron pairs that contribute to it as well as the bond angle and also it's good to know examples for each so we have a linear shape molecule and this is where we have two bonding pairs and zero lone pairs and the bond angle is 180 degrees so an example of a linear molecule is carbon dioxide co2 because we have two bonding regions these double bonds so we refer to double bonds as a bonding region so it's not four bonding, bonding pairs it's just two bonding pairs and then we have no lone pairs on the central carbon atom so these electron pairs, they're going to arrange as far apart in space as possible, which is 180 degrees apart, remembering that the angle of a straight line is 180 degrees. Then we have trigonal planar, and this is where we have three bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. So the bond angle is 120 degrees. An example of a trigonal planar molecule is boron trichloride, which we represent like this. So because all of the chlorine atoms are in the same plane, we just draw a single line for each. And then a tetrahedral molecule has four bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. So the bond angle for, for this is 109.5 degrees. And an example is, as we saw earlier, CH4. And we have two atoms in the plane of the paper. And then we have one atom going into the plane of the paper and another atom going out of the plane of the paper. And as you can see, we kind of get this pyramid shape when we draw lines between the outer atoms. And then trigonal bipyramidal is when we have five bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. And the bond angle is 90 degrees and 120 degrees. So an example of a trigonal bipyramidal molecule is PCl5. So we have three atoms in the plane of the paper and the bond angle here is the 90 degree bond angle. And then we have one atom going into the plane of the paper and we have one atom coming out of the plane of the paper. And that bond angle there is 120 degrees. Then octahedral is where we have six bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. And the bond angle is 90 degrees. So an example is SF6 and we represent it like this. And the drawing of octahedral molecules is probably the most important to remember because it comes up in module five in transition elements. So we have two atoms in the plane of the paper, two atoms out of the plane of the paper and two atoms into the plane of the paper. So it's relatively easy to remember. Then we have non-linear molecules. So this is where we have lone pairs involved. And in a nonlinear molecule, we have two lone pairs and two bonding pairs. And the lone pairs reduce the bond angle because they repel more strongly than bonding pairs. So the bond angle in a nonlinear molecule is 104.5 degrees. And an example of a nonlinear molecule is H2O, water. Then finally, we have pyramidal molecules. And this is where we have three bonding pairs and one lone pair. And this reduces the bond, bond angle from trigonal planar, which is 120 degrees. To 107 degrees. So an example of a pyramidal molecule is ammonia because the nitrogen has one lone pair and three bonding pairs. Okay so bond polarity. So the definition of electronegativity is the power of an atom to attract the pair of electrons in a covalent bond and it's affected by the nuclear charge, the atomic radius and the shielding by electrons in inner shells. So nuclear charge is dependent on the number of protons in the nucleus. Atomic radius is dependent on the number of electron shells in the atom and shielding by electrons in the inner shells is also dependent on the number of electron shells. So this means that electronegativities increase across periods and decrease down groups, making fluorine the most electronegative atom. So in the pooling scale, a method developed by Linus Pauling of comparing the electronegativities of different atoms. Most electronegative atoms are those that are furthest to the right and the highest up in the periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table, fluorine is far to the right and is also at the top of the periodic table. You also have oxygen and nitrogen, which are the second most electronegative atoms. And in the pooling scale, the higher the electronegativity value, 
the higher the electronegativity of the atom. Polar bonds form between atoms with different electronegativity values. So fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen because it has a greater nuclear charge as it has an extra proton in its nucleus. It has a smaller atomic radius as the greater nuclear charge means that the outer shell is pulled closer to the nucleus. It has the same shielding as oxygen, so the nucleus has a greater attraction to the electrons in the covalent bond. So polar bonds form between atoms with different electronegativity values, causing a permanent dipole. Partial negative charges and partial positive charges show that a bond is polar. Molecules containing polar bonds are not always polar. The symmetry of polar bonds can cancel the effect of any permanent dipole. So, for example, CCl4 on the left, is not polar, as the molecule is symmetrical, and the dipoles oppose each other, causing them to be cancelled out. On the other hand, CH3Cl is a polar molecule, as the dipole is not opposed and is not cancelled out. So this CCl dipole, because carbon and hydrogen are very similar electronegativities, there's no dipoles on these bonds. So there's only one dipole, and so the dipole isn't cancelled out. Intermolecular forces. So Induced dipole-dipole London forces are caused by the temporary unequal distribution of charge due to the constantly moving electrons in molecules. So in molecules, electrons are always moving, they never stop moving. And the temporary dipole can induce a temporary dipole in a neighbouring molecule and the two dipoles will be attracted to each other. These forces occur between all molecules and it's the weakest intermolecular force meaning it requires little energy to overcome. Then we have permanent dipole-dipole forces, which are caused by molecules with a permanent dipole being attracted to the opposite charge in other permanent dipoles. They're stronger than London forces, but they're weaker than hydrogen bonding, which is a strong dipole-dipole attraction between the lone pair of electrons on a highly electronegative oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, partially negative atom of a molecule, and a delta positive hydrogen atom on a neighbouring molecule. Hydrogen bonding is responsible for some of the anomalous properties of water. So for example, it allows ice to be less dense than water, as hydrogen bonds hold the water molecules apart at a fixed position, forming an open lattice. So this is why when water freezes, it expands. Also, water has a higher melting and boiling point than expected due to hydrogen bonds being the strongest intermolecular forces. So most simple molecules only have London forces which require little energy to overcome, whereas hydrogen bonds require a lot more energy to overcome. So water has higher boiling points than most simple molecular structures. So you can see a diagram of a hydrogen bond. They always ask you to label the hydrogen bond in, when you're drawing a diagram of it. And you can see it's between the delta positive hydrogen atom on one molecule and the lone pair of electrons on the del highly electronegative delta negative oxygen atom on the other molecule. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my other videos, including the Module 2 playlist, to see how I answer exam questions. You can also visit my website to purchase my notes and flashcards. The link will be in the description. Mm -hmm.